You know, I, I've been here for a year now with Grace, and I've heard so many life-changing stories like Ron's. And um, I'm just going to be honest with you. It, I've kind of been speechless every time I've heard of a story. I've spoken with some people. I've, I've heard the stories. I've watched the stories. And I'm just like, like I don't know how to respond completely, right? To, it's so radical, the, the stories that are going on and, and the life change that's going on. And, and you know what I thought I was, you, you know what hope first and celebrate recovery was called in the first century in the New Testament? It was called church, <laughs> right? God has been in the business of life change since the beginning. And here's the reality. There's only two types of people, those in recovery and those in denial. We are all a work in progress. We all need Jesus. And so this is something that has been going on for centuries. We have a good God and recovery is possible. But the other piece of this hope first is this prevention and, and this next generation that's coming up. And so today I just want to talk a little bit about this next generation and, and, and what we need to do as adults here in the church. I don't know if you guys ever watch uh, the Olympics, Summer Olympics. Um, I like to watch it when I can. Uh, in 2004, the Athens Olympics, there was a four by one women's relay team for the United States and they were favored to win. But in the leg, from the third leg to the fourth leg, they tried to pass the baton off and dropped the baton. It was tragic. I mean, if, if you've ever done a four by one relay, like at your high school or in college or something, you know the devastation and the feeling of dropping the baton and losing the race. And this is what happened in 2004. In 2008, this nightmare was repeated, not only by the four by one women's relay team, but also the men's four by one relay team both dropped the baton in the 2008 Beijing Olympics for the United States. Again, years of training, years of drills and, and, and going to practice. And, and again, they, 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 they drill this over and over, passing the baton and the right technique and, and, and all those kinds of things. And this 20 meter exchange zone that they are drilling over and over and over so that they can pass the baton off successfully. The, 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 the runner who has the baton has some kind of cue word like stick or go or something to signal the front runner to reach out, right? To reach his hand or her hand out to receive the baton. If, if this front runner says this signal stick too soon, it might be too much of a distance, a gap, and they might not reach each other. If they say it too late, there could be a collision between the two runners, right? It is so critical, this exchange zone, this 20 meters of, of, of a baton being passed. And here's the incredible thing. You could be the most talented runner, the fastest sprinter. You could have all four, the fastest sprinters on the team. All four individually might be the most talented on the field. But if the baton is not passed, nobody wins. If the exchange does not happen, if the handoff does not occur, nobody wins. And this is what happened to the United States. And today I want to talk about passing the baton off to the next generation and how critical it is. There was a um, pretty prominent guy in the Bible named Moses. You ever heard of him before? Moses, all right, yeah. Moses, uh, you know, he's, he's a pretty cool guy in scripture, right? Pretty popular guy. Led the nation of Israel out of Egyptian slavery, okay? He, he showed and displayed the power of God through plagues on Egypt and, and parting the Red Sea with a stick, bow, right? And the sea parted. I mean, just, just extraordinary things he displayed through the power of God. Eventually, Moses trained up a successor, someone who he could pass the baton of faith onto, and so after Moses died, Joshua stepped up. Joshua, a young promising leader, skilled, talented, all those things. 
You know what's interesting when I read the scriptures, when I read the story, when I, when I read the word of God and, and what happened in the nation of Israel, I, I look at today and I'm going, there are so many movies that were created about Moses, right? I mean, probably an old-fashioned one. You probably know this one. Charlton Heston's The Ten Commandments, right? Moses, Moses. You know, like that. We all have done that, right, before. Uh, the, the Prince of Egypt, there's an animated version. Also, several other kinds of movies that have, that have come out about Moses. Not too many movies about Joshua, though. Joshua was the one who led him into the promised land, right? I mean, what's going on? Not too many about Joshua, but everyone knows Moses. I wonder why that is. Because again, this guy sat under Moses. This guy was his successor. And here's the problem with Joshua that many of us don't even realize. Joshua never had a, quote, Joshua. Joshua never passed the baton of faith on to someone else. And so after Moses died, Joshua took his place. After Joshua and that generation died, the nation of Israel went into one of the darkest times in their history, something called the Judges. The Judges. Judges chapter 2 says this, verse 10. After that generation died, that's Joshua and his generation, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. That chapter goes on to say they did evil in the sight of God and they drifted from him. You know, over the, over the years, generations and generations have come and gone. There's been a lot of changes in our generations, okay? I don't know if any of you guys ever remember the boom box. You guys remember the boom box? The boom box, now we have AirPods, okay? But, you know, real quick, raise your hand if you ever carried a boom box on your shoulder. Yeah, party animals right there. You just identified yourself. Yeah, yeah, there's a boom box. You held, you held the boom box right there, right? And now we have AirPods. You know, I remember when Bluetooth technology came out and I saw someone in the, in the airport talking to themselves. <laughs> Security, <laughs> you know, like, no, it was in their ear. They were just talking, right? So today we have, we have AirPods. I remember when, um, uh, you know, I heard about the radio coming out. I wasn't re- you know, born when it first came out, but there was a thing called a radio that was revolutionary, right? And now, of course, we have Alexa who decides when she wants to work, you know? <laughs> it, sometimes it doesn't work, you know? We, uh, there was a time uh, where when we were, used to deliver messages, the only way to deliver a message was through a carrier on horseback, and now we just text it, right? We just say it. We just text, message anybody. Generations have come and gone. Things have changed over time. But our current generation, are, they're dealing with some things. Not just the millennials, the Generation Z, those who are in middle school, high school, right? They're coming up and they're dealing with some things and there's some statistics on this current generation. I'm just gonna list a few of them. It says this, one in three kids grow up without their father. One in three. Incarceration rates have gone up 500% in the last 30 years. Depression and suicide rates are skyrocketing among young people. And one statistic said that seven out of 10 young people have at least considered suicide. It's crossed their mind. There's an overwhelming amount of uh, students and young people that are feeling abandoned, by the adults in their lives, and let me just say, that right there is the number one conversation I have with young people. The feeling of abandonment, loneliness, nobody understands me, my parents don't get me, I don't know what to do, I feel lost. If I told my parents there's no way they would ever receive me, right? The feeling of abandonment, they don't get it. All that, that's the number one conversation I have with young people today. Barna Group, a research group, says this. It says that 59% drop out of the church by the time they reach adulthood. 59. Nearly 60%. Six out of the 10 kids, right? Six out of your kids. 60% of your children. I don't know about you, but that, that does something to me. It, does, it like stirs me up a little bit. I read that, I'm going, hold on a second. We're going to lose 60%? 
That kind of shakes me up. It makes me angry. Sorry if I'm yelling, but it makes me angry. And I don't know about you, but I can't just read that and just not do anything. 59% will just walk away. Barna Group Research also did a, a, an inter- interesting study between um, uh, teenagers 13 to 17. Interesting uh, a thing they did is said that 56% of 13 to 17 year olds think that it's wrong to not recycle. Okay. Same study, same group of young people. Only 32% think it's wrong to view pornography, which means more young people today think not recycling is worse than watching pornographic images. Again, this generation that's coming up, adults, leaders in the room, listen, they need to hear what you have to say. They are looking and waiting for leaders, for adults to speak into their life. They are needing it. And what an indictment, what a sad indictment it would be if our church, the adults and leaders in our church in the year 2018, right, today, refuse not to pour in to the next generation, refused it, refused to pour into them, refused to pass this baton off And another generation arises in America, northern Nevada and Reno, that did not know God, that did not know the Lord. How sad it would be if we just stood around and did nothing and just watched as this generation slowly drifted away. Because listen, it doesn't matter how blessed you are or talented you are. It doesn't matter how anointed you are how much is in your bank account, how popular you are. It doesn't matter at all. What matters and what's so important right now in this time is if we don't get the baton of faith into the hands of the next generation, then we have not run our race or finished our course, period. If we do not do that, if we do not do that, then we have not run our race or finished our course. Nobody wins, Andy Stanley, he says it this way. The value of life is not measured by how much we accumulate, but by how much of it we give away. How much we accumulate, but by how much of our life we give away. See, listen, we are part of a divine relay. This is not an individual sprint effort. It's not about our personal agenda. It's not a denominational issue. It's not a music style issue. It's not whether the music is too loud or too soft. It's not the preaching style that you prefer. It's not how you dress. None of that is the issue. The issue, listen, is whether or not we are committed to running the race in this divine relay that God has appointed us with integrity so that we can pass this on to the next generation, to our children, to our students, because they are counting on you and me. You know, Grace Church didn't just arrive in Reno by accident. It's been a part of a movement that's been happening for generations before us. See, because the church is not a building that you come and sit in. It's a movement that you choose to be a part of. Let me say that again. The, the church, it is not a building that you and I come and sit in every week. The church is a movement that you and I have chosen to be a part of, to represent Jesus wherever we go and to pat- pass the baton off to the next generation. But real quick, Those of you who are young people in the room, those of you who are the next generation in the room, let me just speak to you for a moment because I've been speaking to the adults. Let me speak to you for a moment because just as important as it is for the older generation to pass the baton, it is for the younger generation to receive it and to receive it well. See, I get the opportunity all year long to speak around the country to student camps and conferences for young people. And here's my concern. My concern with this next generation is that a lot of them feel entitled. They feel that they don't have to do any work, that they don't have to wait at all and just get all the glory for it. They, 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 they kind of have this attitude and, and, and this, this mindset that just says, give me the baton. Why do I have to wait? 
I don't want to wait for you or take time, you know, learning something or growing in my character. Why? My concern is that there's this generation that would rather be discovered over being developed. They'd rather just show up and right and just arrive on the top over being developed, grown. And I think so often what they don't realize, what this next generation coming up doesn't realize is that their character, listen, must match their calling. It's not just having a calling or it's not just having an anointing on your life. Their character has to match the calling or there's going to be this chasm, this gap, and a potential drop of the baton. It's so critical, and I, I see this all over the country. I see it in young people over and over. They confuse their talent with character all the time. Their talent with character. But I'm gifted. I got what it takes. I could do that better than you. You're probably right. But they've confused talent with character. We got a generation who's coming up and even going like, I don't know if I like this baton. I don't know if I like the color of it how it kind of looks or makes me feel, (laughs) right? This is the generation. This is a concern of mine. And I watch these conversations happen, and I engage in some of these conversations and with this young generation coming up. But, but, But listen to me. Young people in the room, we are needing a generation of leaders coming up that is willing to do whatever it takes and have the attitude that says, not my will, but yours be done, O Lord Almighty. Not mine, but yours. We need a generation that's coming up that, listen, although you may have been dealt a difficult hand in life, you do not use that as an excuse to act up. We need this young person, this, the 20 year olds and, and, the, and the teenagers that are coming up that listen, although you may feel like life has thrown you to the wolves, you are not discouraged, no, because you see it as an opportunity to come back leading the pack. That's how you treat it. And that's the kind of generation that needs to come up that's gonna do mighty things for the glory of God that we're gonna say, stick! And you're gonna receive it and you're gonna go running for the glory of God. Some of you know my story and I've shared some things about it. But I, I grew up in kind of some difficult circumstances in, in my early, early years. My family, we were on welfare for a little bit. We moved from apartment to apartment. I remember Christmas was toys for tots. I remember that. Wouldn't have all that much. I had a father who was physically abusive to me. I had a father who did things to my sisters that I'd rather not say in detail, but there was a time that I actually walked in on it. It was a very difficult time in my teenage years. It was a very hard time. My father eventually went to prison and and I didn't see him for years. But there was something going on in my life. It was hard and it was dark. It was difficult. And I remember I heard this verse, Psalm 68, Verse five, it says, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. A father to the fatherless. Now listen, I didn't see a dove ascended from heaven, right? I I didn't see like a mystical force in the clouds. Instead, God laid it on someone's heart to reach out to me, an adult, a person in the church, a man by the name of Ted Harkins. Ted Harkins was an elder in the church that I was going to. This is a picture of him and his wife, Mary. And this man came over. He would come over to my house, pick me up, and take me to jujitsu classes that the church was offering. Pretty cool church. (laughs) And your pastor knows how to defend himself, so watch out. No. (laughs) All are welcome at grace. Okay, don't be there. (laughs) But he would take me, and he'd pick me up, take me to these classes, and I remember we'd have all kinds of conversations, all kinds of conversations, and let me just say, half of them, I had no idea what he was talking about. I'm like, I don't even know what you said. What? I'm sorry, what? You know? Right? I I mean, I'm a young preteen, middle schooler. I mean, that that was about the age, and I remember he would come over, he'd pick me up, we'd we'd go to jujitsu, he'd drop me back on, you know, off my house, and, and that was the, it wasn't, he wasn't trying to be cool. 
He didn't say, I need to go to the mall and dress like a young person or I can't relate, right? He didn't buy into the myth that I have gray hair so now I can't be used in a young person's life. He didn't believe that myth. He wasn't even trying to be right. Listen, he was trying to be real. Because people would always rather follow someone who's real than someone who's always right. So Ted Harkins became the father to the fatherless in my life. There were other men, John Lorenz, who was my Awana leader, and, and, and Brian Hendry, who would always listen to me when I had issues or problems. And, and, and then there was another guy, my, my youth leader, Mark Peacock, who, who would always make me laugh some way, somehow, with his Jim Carrey impressions. He was a weirdo, okay? <laughs> but he was another person. And listen, none of them had like specific abilities. They were not theologians. They did not know scripture like inside and out. It wasn't even about all those things. They weren't like, ha- ha- had all these abilities. They had availability. And that's exactly what God used. And listen, they became in my life the father to the fatherless. Let me say this, because I have hindsight now on some of this. The statistics were against me. Every research and case study would have had me on the side of the road in a dark place or dead by 30. They were all against me. I should not have worked out if it wasn't for the adults in my life that decided to say, I'll go, I'll meet with them, I'll talk with them. If it wasn't for the adults in my life who were willing to say, I need to pass this baton off to that young man over there. I need to meet with them. I need to talk with them. I need to spend time with them. I need to pass this baton. I need to pray for them. All those things, if it wasn't for them. And now, listen, I am a living proof of someone who's a teen survivor of tragedy and trial and dark times. How is that possible? Yes, because Jesus saves. Yes, because God forgives. But listen, God also uses people to heal, to restore, to renew, to recover. That's who he sends. He sends people. And all throughout history, when the people of God had challenges and problems, God would send a deliverer. God would send a person. And I wonder if you are that person for a young person in your life. This is what Psalm 78 verses five through seven says. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them. Even the children not yet born and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. We don't have a choice. We need to pass the baton. We have to stop sitting back and crossing our arms and pretending like Nothing's wrong or just complaining. We need to step in to the line of fire. We need to step in and pass the baton to this next generation or they will lose and, and not remember what God has done. The team will lose. Nobody will win. And this next generation coming up is critical. Because listen, I didn't say this in the other service. I'm going to say it now. If this is the last days, since this is the last days, if this is the fourth leg, the fourth leg is usually the strongest on the team. The the fourth leg is usually the fastest, the one who can bring it back if they're behind. They have the greatest potential to do the greatest work and move of God ever. Does that, do, do we get this? It is critical for us to pass this baton. So I'm gonna give you, just encourage you with a few things real quick before we leave today. Number one, would you pray? Would you pray and not just say you're gonna pray and not just say, hey, I'm gonna pray for you later and do it and then forget? Would you pray? Would you commit to actually praying? No one has ever done anything great for God aside from prayer. Prayer equals change. Would you pray and say, dear Lord, I pray for this next generation. 
And Satan, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You cannot have this generation. You cannot have my kids. Would you pray and commit to praying? Number two, would you serve? Are you willing to serve? I'm standing before you because someone decided to serve me. Would you serve? And I get this all the time. People ask, Miguel, do you need help in kids and students? Let me help you see it in a different way. It's not about whether or not we need help. This is an opportunity for you to leverage your leadership and listen, pass the baton off to the next generation. Would you serve? We have an opportunity real quick too for you. If you want to serve and you're already feeling it, you're like, I need something. I need, I need to hear something. I want, I want to get involved some way, somehow. Uh, right now, you can take your phones out and you can text kids help to the number 411247. Kids help to the number 411247. You can take a screenshot of this if you'd like to just remember it. Kids help to the number 411247 and we'll follow up with you, get you involved, get you serving, get you going and pouring into this next generation. And last, listen, would you connect with someone? Would you connect with a young person? Would you take a moment, take, take some time, take them to lunch, uh, go to your next door neighbor, whatever young person is in your life, would you be willing to connect with them? Because listen, this next generation, how much is it worth for the next generation to have the baton of faith in their hands? How much of that is it worth? And let me just say, it's worth everything, everything. Would you pray, would you serve, and would you connect?